Good afternoon, colleagues, friends, VC, African wood hoopoos. You'll see later why that's important. Um, welcome to this really exciting occasion, the launch of UJ's SLP on the Sustainable Development Goals. It comes in the tradition of our MOOCs, which we're becoming really well known for, and we're very excited about this one. Without further ado, I'm going to call on our DVC academic to open the proceedings. And I know that he's very well known to all of you, so I'm not going to go through a lengthy CV, you'll be pleased to know. Um, but we do want to know a bit more about him. So I'm afraid, DVC, we're putting you a little bit on the spot. And I'm going to ask you two questions, and you need to be careful because the answers may be revealing. <laughs> OK. You can choose to answer both or either one. The first one I want to know about is what book is next to your bed? And the second one I want to know about is what is your favorite movie and why? Can you please come over here to respond? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Denise, uh, Dr. Webstock. 
Uh, two important questions, but let me start by observing, uh, you know, the right protocols and um, acknowledge the presence of our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Pro uh, Professor uh, uh, Marala, and uh, the General Counsel. Uh, I see you there at the back. Uh, welcome. Uh, other MEC members, members of council that may be joining online or those who might watch this video afterwards, um, members of ELG, I saw deans, I saw uh, colleagues, you know, fr from various faculties, vice deans, and, and also senior leadership and, and colleagues, you know, uh, from the university, the people that makes this institution tick. So I welcome each and every one of you senior directors in my domain. It's really, this is a wonderful uh, uh, moment. I don't want to leave everyone. I see Prof. Bettine uh, Panfiran there at the back, you know, you are senior director, but not in my domain, but I welcome you and all the senior colleagues, junior, whoever here, you are welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you very much for setting time aside to, to, to join us as we launch this important short learning uh, program. Uh, if I may move uh, now to the two questions. Hmm. I would say books uh, next to my bed, because I share a bed, you know. <laughs> uh, 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 so, so on my side, there are three books. One we share. The first one, uh, believe it or not, is, uh, is the Holy Bible. And, and I'm, I'm like a boring type, because I have this thing for Proverbs. Whenever I, <laughs> I grab the Bible, I go straight to Proverbs, you know, and there's a lot of wisdom in there, and if you ask me why. And the second book that I go through again and again is The Art of War. I'm not a warring type, but, you know, I can't get enough of that book. I won't lie to you. It's like Animal Farm, especially the section where it says all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. I just stop there and laugh. And another important book, interestingly, it's almost like I thought uh, um, I knew you would ask me. It's a book uh, that I wanted to refer to in my opening remarks, and it's called Extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win. It's by two former Navy SEALs, um, Yoko Willink and Liv Babin. Now, those who may not know uh, Navy SEALs, you know, this are elite fighting machine with the U.S., you know. Um, I remember passing as a compliment after some of my colleagues did a wonderful job. I said, you guys are silent professionals. They call them silent professionals because they don't go out there taking um, uh, glory for their work. They go in, get the job done, and leave silently. And they work generally in small teams, you know. For example, the famous one is SEAL Team 6, where it's only six members. They go there and get the job done. I'm not the one who promotes violence, but you know, if you want to know about the efficiency, ask Osama. But then I assume you, know, you don't want to go and meet him where he is if there is hell. You know. I don't want to say controversial things, but yeah, this is how efficient they are. Exceptional people. And these two gentlemen led the, the Navy SEALs teams and they worked there. And in the opening remarks of their book, their book is not about the war, but it's about leadership and taking ownership, but not just ownership, extreme ownership. And I quote what they say in their um, preface of this book, which I wanted to share as part of my opening remarks and why we're doing this, and I, an open quote. They say, of many exceptional leaders we served alongside throughout our military careers, the consistent attribute that made them great was that they took absolute ownership, extreme ownership, not just of those things for which they were responsible, but for everything that impacted their mission. These leaders cannot, uh, 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 these leaders' apologies cast no blame. They made no excuses. Instead of complaining about challenges or setbacks, they developed solutions and solved problems. They leveraged assets, relationships, and resources to get the job done. Their own egos took a back seat to the mission and their troops, or their troop apologies. These leaders truly led, close quote. And I thought, as we launch this uh, um, short learning program, Introduction to Social Development Goals, I thought about extreme ownership. As the university, we, we are those type of leaders, you know. Um, we do not say, because of the global grand challenges that we are facing, uh, 
uh, um, you know, we inherited this is not our problem. We are taking extreme ownership to contribute, leverage whatever assets we have, leverage whatever resources we have, and make a contribution uh, that uh, we can. And as a leading university uh, in South Africa, on the continent, and in the world. So this is why this is so special to me. And I wanted to share this. And when you ask about the book, I thought I should share this. And in a way, it reflects who I am, taking extreme ownership, casting no blame, and leveraging whatever resources that you have. In terms of the movie, hmm, it's an interesting one. There are a number of movies that come to mind. Western, I enjoyed Western. Karate, you know, I also enjoy. But there is one movie that is more special than others, and it's Titanic. And if you ask me why, I, I was a poor student at, at, at Vista University, and I wanted to take my girlfriend out, you know, um, now my wife, you know, uh, to, for, uh, <laughs> you know, to the movies, uh, to watch Titanic. Everybody was talking about Titanic. And, and she fell ill before we could uh, go and watch the movie. And I had already told her, I'm going to take you out. So when she got well, she came and said, I'm okay now, shall we go? But the money was gone. I had to use it for other pressing matters. Uh, so I, I, I came clean and I said, look, then I had money, but I had to use it for other things. So, and she said, oh, don't worry about it. We will watch it one day or watch something else one day when we have money. And I said, hell, this is a keeper. That my favorite, uh, why it's my favorite movie, we eventually watched it uh, at home, you know, way, way, when it was out of the circuit. I'm sure if I were to ask you to take a guess which one you think where they are standing there in front, no, no, that is not. My favorite part, which I think is even relevant, not that I'm a crazy man, but what stuck with me, and which is also relevant to the SLP we are launching, is where the captain when the, do you remember the captain with his white beard? He said, gentlemen, there aren't enough lifeboats on this vessel. Only a few of us are going to make it. What is the relevance of this, I said. But let me tell you the second part that stuck with me. And I always told my students, is when that band played that uh, you know, song, I think it's nearer to the and one of the guys, this guy started playing and other band mates came back. And then at the end he said to them, gentlemen, it was an honor playing with you this evening. And then the, the, the vessel sank. But that was really touching. For me, um, trying to link this with, uh, you shouldn't have asked me, but to link it with what we are doing, we have a chance to, to load um, more live boats to this vessel, you know in terms of sustainable development goals. We have a chance, you know, to really work on these things. And whatever lifeboat we load on this vessel, no matter how small, imagine if we all bring something, then there will be almost enough for everyone. And I would say, as the University of Johannesburg, by developing this short learning program, we are adding in our own small way lifeboats on these vessels, because climate change is real. Poverty is real, and so on. So with that said, thanks. Um, I'm sure you're regretting why you asked me, but that is not the reason why I have, I have a short speech. Ladies and gentlemen, at the University of Johannesburg, we are serious about our responsibility to engage with current and emerging social, economic, and environmental issues. Finding and implementing sustainable solutions is evident in our research, teaching programs, and how we imagine the future. Ladies and gentlemen, UJ has been recognized for its contribution to sustainability by being ranked as the top African university contributing to the sustainable development goals and within the top 100 universities globally by the 2022 Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. In Sustainable Development Goal 1, on eliminating poverty, UJ takes the third position in the world and the eighth in the world for Sustainable Development Goal 8, which is about decent, decent work and economic growth. UJ is further in the top 100 in the world for Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is about quality education, where we are ranked at number 39, ladies and gentlemen. And when it comes to Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is about gender equality, we are ranked at number 40 in the world. 
Sustainable Development Goal 10, which is about reducing inequalities, we are ranked at number 49. Sustainable Development Goal 12, which is about responsible consumption and production, we are ranked at number 68. And Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is about no hunger, we are ranked at 95. Through UJ's Global Excellence and Stature Program colleagues, we are funding research that uses the fourth industrial revolution as an avenue to accelerate sustainable development goals. We call that Sustainable Development Goals 4.0. With the courses we are launching, we want to raise broader awareness about the issues regarding sustainability that require attention and global efforts. In general, ladies and gentlemen, universities that do not positively impact on their societies do not deserve to be called universities. That is why we decided to design this course, to be part of the solutions to the issues affecting South Africa and the African continent. To sustainable development goals, um, sustainable development goals, sorry, are part of measures to address today's challenges. There is an African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. With this course, we want to bring people on board to make a meaningful impact in addressing various challenges sustainably. By doing this, UJ will remain the university of choice, anchored in Africa, and dynamically shaping the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you'll sign up you know, for this program. We're going to open it up for everyone within UJ and outside UJ, because this is something that is of great importance today. We feel everybody should have access to this and learn about uh, the uh, issues of sustainability so that we can add more live boats to this vessel so that when, if we do well, we won't sink, isn't it? And then we won't have, you know, but if we need this, then we shall have the live boats that we need. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I would like to take this opportunity and thank uh, colleagues that work with me to have this program uh, ready today. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Dr. Webstock. Thank you very much for that uh, inspiring and life-saving metaphor. Thank you. <laughs> for that, Professor Mbedi. Um, very pleased that you could introduce that, but now we have something really special. What's important, actually, is the future. And for whom is the future important? And the future is important for our youth. So now we have a really lovely insert from a grade nine pupil at uh, the Maragon Moikluf High School in Shwani. So, Boykanyo Mosiro is here with us on a video. It's a four minute video. She has become known for her recycling efforts and she is really committed to a better future for us all. For some of us, it's a bit late now, but for her, it is not. So let's hear from her. <laughs> We need nature, but nature doesn't need us. We share the same planet and we're surrounded by nature daily. And while nature can exist without us, we as humans cannot exist without nature. As wealthy, developed and technologically advanced as we may be right now, ultimately nature is our bedrock to our human existence and it is the key to our human resilience, health, stability and well-being. Our forests, rivers, oceans, and soils provide us with the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, and the water that we use to irrigate our crops and quench our thirst with. Nature provides us with such essential things, and yet sometimes we as humans, we tend to forget and appreciate and acknowledge what nature gives to us every single day. As you all know, our population increases with over 200,000 people a day, meaning there's a high mandate on basic and daily needs, wants, goods, and services, meaning the factory usage increases by 14% weekly, and the use of transportation is a major contributor to gases like carbon dioxide emissions, thus making air pollution. And other factors like generating power, cutting down forests and littering, leads us to our main problem to our planet, which is climate change. The cause and effects of our, our, of our habits are ruining our planet. For example, our oceans are drowning in plastic, ice caps are, our ice caps are 
halfway gone and we are the cause of up to 150 species a day that lead to extinction. Two thirds of our rainforest has already been destroyed. Phytoplankton has decreased by 40% and half of our coral reefs have been eliminated. They combine and produce 80% of our oxygen. As you can see, our global temperature and our country temperature has increased by two to three degrees. And globally, our temperature should increase by at least two to three degrees within the next three decades. If we continue down this path, 500 of our biggest cities will be underwater. Half the population will face 20 days of lethal heat every year and oceans will be completely devoid of life. Although it is good to do your part, this isn't a problem that can be fixed with just riding a bicycle or recycling. It is a question to whether we will let millions of people destroy our home for a profit or whether we will stand together and take back our home. Whether we will save our world or whether we will sit back and watch people suffocate and fight wars over our resources before we're even old enough to retire. It'll be a matter of time before our nature is completely destroyed forever or we will be too late to save our nature. Let's take our time to love this creation before it's completely gone forever. Let's find peace and care for this that we are blessed with. For we are a danger to this creation, yet we need nature, but nature doesn't need us. Thank you. So thank you to Boykanyo for reminding us what's important and for helping us to look ahead um, and see why we do these things. Um, and I, I hope that her message will be amplified by our keynote speaker, um, who is joining us virtually. Um, our keynote speaker is Professor Erika Nkremo Mbula. She, is, she seems to like threes. Um, because she is a DSI NRF Newton Fund Trilateral Chair at UJ in three things, um, transformative uh, innovation, the fourth industrial revolution, and sustainable development. And I can't tell you how happy I am to see those three things coming together in one place. And I see that Erica is working with her research students and young scholars on that. Um, and her research work revolves very much around innovative systems for sustainable and equitable development. As I said, she is currently in Europe. Um, she is with a PhD academy, again working with young people, so we salute that. Um, and I hope that she's not too hot. We have seen all those distressing pictures of Europe when the dried up rivers and the heat and so on. But she's in Finland, so she might be okay. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over to Erica. Thank you. Erica, welcome. Hi. 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 Good afternoon, and thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, let me try and upload my slides so I get that out of the way. Um, are you able to see the slides? Okay, excellent. So, so thanks so much for um for that introduction. I am uh, yes, I uh, I'm, it is it is a pleasure to uh, to be here and to be able to um to uh, give a, some short remarks uh, about this short learning program uh, on the SDGs. Uh, the only thing I'm sorry about is not to be there in person. I'm, I'm as you mentioned, I'm teaching at a PhD academy in Finland, where um it is reasonably. Okay, it's quite hot, but it's a, but it's, it's, it's manageable, um, and uh, and there is a lot of discussion around sustainability. So I am really um, uh, talking here not only to students from all over the world, but also to the local authorities who are very concerned about about moving into a more digital and um, sustainable future. So what they refer as the twin transition. Um, so uh, the thematic focus of this program is, is essential. Uh, the SDGs capture what we call the big problems of our time, and I will try in these few minutes uh, to highlight why it, it matters to us as individuals, uh, to us as uh, scholars, and to us as an institution of higher education. So I'll try and give some reflections uh, as to why the SDGs should permeate our three missions of teaching, uh, research, and community engagement. 
Um, the previous uh, uh, video that we had really set the scene very nicely um, uh, for, for what I wanted to say. So I'm, I'm happy to be speaking afterwards, um, which already gave us a sense of the urgency uh, that, that we're facing. Uh, there is a growing uh, shared feeling that we're living at this turning point in, in history. The pandemic uh, that we are slowly coming out from has uh, exacerbated that feeling perhaps, but it was already there. And uh, this feeling is, is, is based on observation of evidence. Uh, all the indicators are telling us that we are moving beyond uh, planetary boundaries uh, related to climate change, biodiversity loss, and the, and the use of resources. Uh, and below the um, social floor uh, in the global north and the global south, uh, the same in terms of rising inequalities, uh, civil unrest and instability. And this is creating a shared understanding that we need fundamental changes and, and, and that we need them urgently. So uh, we are converging to that shared view, uh, I believe. There is this well-known work by teams uh, such as those in Stockholm University and other places that have helped us identify um, the processes that regulate the stability and the resilience of our Earth systems. And it's uh, really becoming loud and clear that we need urgent action to operate within what is known as this safe operating space. Um, they measure those safe boundaries uh, around various uh, natural systems that suggest that we have trespassed um, um, several of those boundaries and, and that we're moving rapidly into others. Um, I won't go into detail here, but these natural systems are interconnected and we also don't know where what um, crossing those thresholds means for other uh, 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 of those of those boundaries, what sort of biophysical changes will come through uh, as we as we trespass the the, um, the boundaries around climate change, around uh, ocean acidification, and so on. Um, then we have the evidence uh, related to inequality and for instance the global report on inequality uh, which is done annually show us this shocking reality that that 0.8 percent of the population uh, shares nearly 45 percent of the wealth uh, whereas nearly the 75 percent um, uh, below share, share just over uh, uh, sorry 65 percent share um, uh, just close to two two percent and this is the stark reality of, of global inequality. And, and the poor in wealth are, con are concentrated in Africa and the poorer Asian uh, nations. So this affects us directly. Uh, these trends are have become worse uh, with the pandemic, um, and uh, but but, uh, but these trends are not inevitable. And I think it's very important to. Um, to see that way, uh, because they are the results of choices, policy choices, individual choices, institutional choices. And uh, studies have shown the possible scenarios uh, that we face in the future, depending on the different choices and decisions that are made. So we have agency, we have a chance to act. And I think it's very important to uh, to understand and to to see it in that in that in that way. Um, with this graph that I, I, I find extremely useful, um, I think we can we can see how important this is for the context of South Africa, how important it is for the context of Africa, these discussions. And what this graph is telling us is that we have been unable um, to marry the objective of improving people's well-being, which is uh, set by this Human Development Index, um, uh, with living within uh, the environmental limits. And those two um, lines here tell us the, the world biocapacity and the and the sort of the levels of human of human development. Countries that have managed to reach a high and very high levels of human development have done it at the expense of surpassing the share of um, of uh, biocapacity. And what we have here on the uh, on the on the bottom part of the of the uh, of the graph is the African countries that um, that that are, are need to find ways of moving horizontally across that graph, uh, because on the right hand side, uh, the the experience from the high income countries that have utilized knowledge that has allow for major improvements in, in, in the quality of life, in life expectancy, access to education, the well-being of the population. The same type of knowledge has uh, brought about negative environmental and social impacts, or it hasn't managed to mitigate that. So what, what does that mean for the kind of knowledge that we need in that, in that area where we are situated? 
uh, in those yellow dots in the in the in the graph, what kinds of knowledge do we need to ensure that that uh, that we move these countries horizontally within our world biocapacity uh, limits? We don't have four planets, therefore we need to find ways of uh, of shifting into that direction. Um, so the the SDGs really give us um, a compass. Um, to reach a better and more sustainable future by 2030. And this is in eight years, and uh, we are awfully off track. And the, the pandemic has not do that, that has not made us any 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 favors. And um, the SDGs aim at leaving no one behind, and, and most of those that are left behind live in Africa. Uh, so for the SDGs to succeed, we know that they must succeed in our context. Um, it's very important to look at the context of Africa as the epicenter of this transformation in connection to the SDGs. And, um, and I think what, what it really has done is has reaffirmed the importance of not only change, but the direction of change. So we cannot no longer talk about economic growth without looking at the quality of that growth. Is that growth leading to uh, not only prosperity, which is the, the upper um, uh, circle in this in this figure, but is it is it also um, uh, leading to um, dignity, justice, uh, the values of people? Is a human centric type of uh, of growth? Is it what is what are the effects on our planet and, and the natural environment? So I think the SDGs are very very um, useful to guide uh, the direction of change. And there are various framings that give us a space to think about these discussions academically and in practice. And I don't want to take too much time on this, but I think the discussions are. Um, uh, picking up in the context of South Africa in particular in terms of uh, just transitions and sustainable transitions and I just wanted to give uh, a minute of, uh, of, of describing how how um, these framings are very important because it help us it help us think about um, the type of knowledge that is needed uh, to to guide these transitions and the concept of just transitions describe this shift from the current uh, economic and social structure uh, which is based on a more extractive approach to a, to a uh, to a scenario where all jobs and uh, are green and climate friendly, where poverty is eradicated, where communities are able to thrive, and for this to be accomplished, um, workers, universities, governments, and, uh, and employers, they all ha they all need to have a voice and a role in the transition uh, uh, process. These ideas of just transition really emerge from the, um, the labor unions and environmental justice uh, groups that recognize that that um, that it's very important to think about. Um, the, the types of knowledge uh, and, uh, and the careers uh, that are needed to, uh, to mitigate and to ensure that these transitions happen in a, in a socially uh, just um, uh, manner. And I think it brings a lot of challenges in terms of the role of universities in imparting and, um, and creating those skills that are needed for, for a just transition. There are also frameworks that help us look at ways in which um, systems change taking a more historical and technological perspective. And here I just show very quickly the work of uh, Carlota Perez, who has led um, uh, a lot of the discussion around technological revolutions and systemic change and explaining how technologies are adopted and how we move from one um, um, sort of uh, a pattern of development to, to another, uh, which is very much behind the understanding of how technological revolutions uh, take take place. And, uh, and this is based on um, all the ideas around long waves uh, that, that come from um, thinking from the 1930s, uh, from Konda Chief and, and Schumpeter, that, uh, that give us a very good understanding of, uh, of how these waves have happened or revolutions have happened uh, over time. The reason why I show this graph is because there's also thinking around the types of knowledge and skills uh, and the curriculum transitions that are needed to inform these waves. So there is an understanding that we're moving now towards um, uh, another wave that is more guided by knowledge uh, around green chemistry, industrial ecology, renewable energy, green nanotechnology, and so on. So what is the role of universities in, in informing and supporting those technological revolutions, um, as well as the current revolution in which we are, the digital transformation, uh, also uh, referred to as the 4IR. So um, it makes us think about the type of knowledge that is needed uh, to, to, to produce uh, and to support this transition, but also 
uh, ensuring that the knowledge that we generate has social impact. And I wanted to show this because it requires expanding and thinking, rethinking uh, the concept of excellence. Um, excellence in process, uh, excellence in outputs, but also excellence in impact. And, and, and as universities in the Global South, uh, we cannot just focus on one type of excellence, which is current, currently looking at, at the excellence in outputs, but also at the process and the impact. So that I, uh, I would like to urge us to think about that. And I think this, uh, this program really uh, puts uh, this at the center of, of what we can achieve with um, with uh, understanding the, the importance of, of knowledge for social impact. Um, the excellence in process implies thinking about uh, questions such as, is the knowledge that we're generating in, in inclusive? Does it include a diversity of values, a diversity of views? Are women involved in the research process? Is it transparent, democratic, engaged? Uh, so the process of knowledge generation is very important. But also looking at the impact, is it connected to the SDGs? Is it addressing um, the big challenges of our time? I think uh, looking at, at uh, linking research efforts to social goals is very, very important. Um, so I would like to finish with a, with a, a few reflections. Um, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so what I want to, what I want, uh, the message that I wanted to leave us with is uh, that universities can and must play uh, a more proactive and prominent role in embracing the SDGs. And this is the opportunity that, as um, as Prof. Mbedi was was mentioning, is the opportunity ahead of us and the one, and one that we must uh, that we must grab. Uh, and why universities? Well, because we occupy such an important space uh, in society. Um, we fulfill a number of functions that are and, and, and we produce a number of uh, of uh, uh, outputs and expertise that are essential for addressing the SDGs. We train decision makers uh, of tomorrow and we can shape their behavior, uh, their values and their ethics. And, um, and, uh, and, and this is essential. Uh, we also produce scientific knowledge that is able to address the uh, complexity of the, pro of the problems that we face through research and innovation. So the role in terms of tech development demonstration is, is key. Um, I want to talk about Engage, or I wanted to mention Engage scholarship because it's the integration of education with community development. And, uh, and these times of universities as ivory towers um, are a thing of the past. I think the, the SDGs give us a real compass uh, that can guide the types of relationships, collaborations um, that are needed to guide this, this uh, need for inter and transdisciplinarity. Um, so I want to end by saying that universities need the SDGs and, and, and the SDGs need universities. Universities, um, uh, the SDGs uh, provide a, a global framework that can increase the acceptance and the, and the purpose uh, and the relevance of the work that we do. Uh, and, and the perception of that relevance by government, by, uh, by industry, by civil society. And at the same time, universities are powerful engines uh, to, to, um, to uh, provide the knowledge and the expertise that the SDGs uh, urgently need. So, um, so I, I would like to end with this. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I'm so excited to see this, um, uh, this, uh, this, this, this course taken, taken up. Uh, as, as it is said, you know, the best time to uh, plant a tree was five years ago, and the second best time is today. So, uh, so I'm very glad that we are moving into this, into this direction today. Thank you so much. Erica, thank you very much for that really inspiring overview, very comprehensive in a short time, about the issues that are important to us. Um, I'm very glad that you picked up on the trend towards impact. I think that's a very, very important international trend in higher education, and uh, impact clearly has to do a lot with our future and the sustainable development. And I'm also pleased that you talked about um, engaged scholarship. And this particular um, instance, this SLP that is developed, is part of doing that engaged scholarship quickly and getting that impact out there more quickly than we can otherwise do. So with that, I'm going to turn to a different um, approach now. We, and again, of the theme of threes, we have three wise women, <coughs> luckily, um, from UJ, um, as a panel to discuss some of these issues. We have Dr. Toboho Mashifana. She is um, head of department and senior lecturer in the Department of Chemical Engineering at UJ. 
her research work is in waste beneficiation, and uh, she has been awarded and acknowledged for her work. She has an award for emerging researchers from the NRF. She has the Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Award for a Promising Young, young Teacher, and the Dean's Award for the, the Top Achieving Staff Member in the Faculty of Engineering. As I said, wise women. <laughs> then we, all, we have Dr. Leanne Mudley. She is a senior lecturer in the Department of Geography, Environmental Management and Energy Studies. And uh, she is the local director in South Africa at UJ of the Erasmus Mundus Masters in Sustainable Territorial Development. And she is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of, and I don't know what this means, you will tell us, RIMM Sustainability, um, which is based in Singapore. Uh, she is also on the Green Version 2 tool, tool Task Force for the Green Building Council of South Africa and a Scientific Committee member of the John Monet Centre for Excellence on Climate Justice at the University of Padova in Italy. So not only here, but all over the world. Um, and uh, we have, um, you can read the rest of it, in, in your pamphlets, so some acknowledgement um, in the Mail and Guardian. But we also have Dr. Nomali Ngobesi, who is the Deputy Head of Department and Senior Lecturer in the Department of Botany and Plant uh, Biotechnology. Um, and she's a, a registered botanist with our uh, local council for uh, natural scientific professions. And she focuses on food and nutrition security. Interestingly, she uh, explores underutilized African plant species as alternative food sources, to uh, alternatives to exotic crops, that is, and post-harvest processing technologies to extend the shelf life of popular crops. She too has had a lot of recognition for her work, um, and she's on popular media uh, platforms such as a million STEM and ISET science careers, and she has also been nominated as emerging researcher for the 2022 NSTF South 32 Awards. Without further ado, I am going to address some questions to you, um, and just to highlight again why this particular SLB is so important for us right now. So my first question is, and I'm going to address that to Nomali. Okay. My first question is, we know about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but they are a little bit time bound. They end at some point in eight years time. So why should we take them seriously? Hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. I don't know if this is on. It's on. Thank you so much, Denise, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues, and uh, those who are joining us from various platforms. Um, you are correct. We've actually set these up to 2030, and people might think they expire. But if you think about sustainability, you're thinking about long term, keeping the world and making it productive on a long term, not only for your lifetime, but also for the lifetime of those to come. So we're at that point where we have to start with development, or at least think about sustainability. People have been saying this for a while. I'm going to take it from a botanist perspective. So we've, we've heard of um, various disasters, natural disasters. We've seen recently hail, rains, cyclones, droughts, floods. Um, this really threatens our food resources, specifically because we mainly focus on three main crops. This would be your maize, wheat, rice. Um, some of us will even go to potatoes. So food security is really threatened by the change uh, brought on by uh, the climate. So we need to now, it's knocked on our doors, sustainability is now on our face, the call is on our face to actually start doing something if you haven't. So my work focuses on just using underutilized crops, looking at underutilized crops, bringing them into our focus and our attention so that we can use them, consider them for the food industry, agriculture industry. Now, you'd find that most of these have been around for a while. We know some of them because we grow them in our home gardens, but you'll still go and buy apples and buy uh, spinach and leave them at home. If you have any interest yourself, you'd, you'd grow and have a home garden where you just do this as a hobby. 
but my interest is to actually shine a spotlight on these so that we can bring them to mainstream agriculture and ensure sustainability in our food system. Um, so we've done this with a couple of um, underutilized crops, looking at morojo, which is usually consumed as spinach. Now, if you can eat this at home instead of buying spinach, the people actually go out and, and, and produce food will start producing it on a large scale commercially. Now, if we do this, we place less pressure on maize. We place less pressure on, on wheat, um, such that if a drought comes, we don't resort to now exporting. We just consume what's already there because they've entered our agricultural system. So that's my perspective. Sustainability is not a call that ends in 2030. We're going to go beyond that, but the action is required now if you haven't started. So this course is, is just covered a perfect time. Wonderful, thank you. So yes, I take forward your message that sustainability is beyond the sustainable development goals and they're a vehicle for that very important um, aspect of our lives. You, start, you touched on why your research is important in this area and I'm going to pose that same question now to, uh, to Boho. Tell me about your research and why it's important in this particular area and how does it advance the sustainable development goals and sustainability? Uh, thank you and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. A lot has been said already. So my research focuses on sustainable development goal number six, number 12 and number 13. And my research is on beneficiation or valorization of solid waste wastewater treatment, resource recovery from waste and byproducts. And why that specifically? This, each and every industry generate a particular waste material. What is happening currently is that most of these industries are generating this waste and landfilling in our environment, which leads to environmental pollution, which may lead to air pollution, contamination of our groundwater and soil, and so many other negative impacts. So my research is looking into, looking into different waste materials that is readily available in our societies, and then treating the waste if it, is, it requires treatment, because most of this waste is actually waste that is hazardous. Meaning that, I mean, the impact thereof is not the impact that we will I mean, will affect the generation today. My children may be affected by that. So it is that way that I'm looking at ways to recover uh, some of these ways where I'm treating these uh, hazardous materials. I think the beauty of it all is that at the end of the research that I'm doing, I do not want to generate any secondary waste. Mm. So in everything, it is a secular economy approach that I'm, I'm applying in my way in the research that I'm doing that. I'm looking at the waste that material that is available, really available, coming in, bringing in solutions so that we can even use that waste for other applications. And in the past years, the applications that we've been looking at is applications in civil engineering. So we'll take a waste material, gold mine tailings, everyone is, is familiar with gold mine tailings. In the, in the east end, west end, there are big tailings, gold mine tailings that are alongside our road. And that is not just a tailing. You can think about that, that we're talking about a solid material that when there is wind, what happens to the communities around that? Mm -hmm. So the impact is not only about the, the, the chemical aspect yeah. of it, you know. The impact is actually, it goes a long way. Uh, I, I, I stay in the East Rand area. There's actually a, a gold mine tailings that is situated next to a very beautiful estate. And someone might be staying there, they just see a beautiful estate. But in years to come, because of what is contained in that material, people may be inhaling the air, people may be drinking. There are pictures that were actually shown uh, somewhere in the, east, in, in, far in, the, in the West Rand in the past, whereby children within the communities were playing in the water streams. Mm -hmm. These water stream contain hazardous um, materials, such as, uh, some of these materials, materials such as uranium. So what is really the impact? So that is what we, I'm, I'm trying to look at, to say that the waste that is available that may, that is contaminating our environment, is not only about us. I still, I, I have kids. I want my kids to be able to play outside without really thinking about heat waves, experiencing uh, cold because of climate change. 
And one of the major things is that there are, we're also creating products, new products, new uh, added products that uh, can replace some of the processes that, such as, I mean, a, an example will be a cement company. Cement company is one of the uh, contributors to climate change because of the carbon dioxide that is emitted. So we're actually looking at the waste that is readily available. How can we produce binders that in the future can actually replace such a material? So yes, that is my very exciting research that I'm passionate about. <laughs> it is indeed exciting and really, really important. And I think that we're seeing that the sustainable development goals have applicability in various disciplines, and in fact, maybe all disciplines. So let's hear from Leanne about how your research is contributing in this respect. Um, is it on? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, I'm from the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. I actually have a science background. I come from zoology. So, um, coming into a different department, I've tried to link the science with a little bit of management and societal aspects as well. So, my um, research basically focuses on SDG 6, clean water and sanitation and different targets in there. So one of the first ones would be obviously water pollution and monitoring thereof analysis. And I think that's um, my science background. So I'm still very passionate about that. But um, like Prof. Erika said, we need to look at how we can start impacting people. And um, there's no use doing all this research just to sit on a shelf and say that we've published. So my work now um, involves the community. So I look at community-based ecological restoration, where we go into the communities, we do the science, we first find out if they want to be involved. We do the science in terms of monitoring and analysis, and then we give the community different aspects of the water. So we tell them what's polluting the water and how we can fix it. And then we work with the community to restore and re rehabilitate. So um, I think in many communities, there's always this mindset that the government must do this and the government must do that. So my research tries to empower the community and create awareness around if we change things, this is our systems. So once people start realizing that they have ownership over natural resources, that's when they start looking after it. And um, like you mentioned, um, Dr. Nomali, that we have that time frame, 2030. Um, but if we give people um, the knowledge and if we create awareness. It's something that whether 2030 comes and goes, it will still be there. So trying to empower people by giving them the knowledge and helping them look after their systems is how I'm trying to um, reach that SDG number six, not just for myself, but for the communities as well. So now the communities are taking ownership. We're involving schools as well. Um, and eventually we get to a point where we then bring the government on board. So once the community is empowered, and then we say to the government, this is how far we've come, please can you assist us further? So that, that's what I do. Thank you very much, that's very inspiring. And which leads me to my last question, and any one of you can answer this. Um, you've talked about how important it is to go out there into the community and empower, and you've all talked about how your research actually furthers this agenda, but what can the university do? To, to take this further. We've got one example today, but what else could we be doing? Nomali, maybe. Well, thank you so much, Denise. With the university focus being primarily teaching and research, um, we are in a good position to generate information and share it and influence our communities. I think it's like Leanne um, said, once you are in a position to make a discovery or come up with a way, a solution to solve a problem, um, then you can start teaching this to students, which is exactly what we do. Uh, by teaching students, you're creating awareness in a community, one community or multiple communities, depending on class numbers. This can impact people, at least influence people in masses. This is an idea going out. They're also getting training to be aware of the solution and how to approach it. 
So that is one aspect, one um, part of, of what we do. And then the other side, which is the strong backbone, which I think we all represent, is the research component and actually coming up the, with these solutions, um, sustainable solutions to actually keeping our world and maintaining our world. Me being on a food industry botani uh, botanical background, uh, from the chemical uh, background and the environmental impact background with my fellow colleagues here. If we come up with solutions together with many other colleagues who are working in various uh, departments within the university, that spreads the message and allows us to teach the next cohort of personnel who are actually going to impact or carry this out in our communities. For me specifically, I'm looking at people who will be interested to cultivate the crops, food industry people who are interested in using the crops, including them in their staple products, in our staple products really. Um, if you look at the foods that we eat specifically, you'd find that most of it is, is um, maize meal based or flour based, uh, which has very nutritional offerings. Um, this is mainly just carbohydrates coming to you. So if you can add any diversity coming from local indigenous crops, you are adding nutritional diversity on top of food security. This is hitting SDG 2 and SDG 1 at the same time and SDG 3. So you want something that's, that's going to be, it starts out in a university, impacts the community in a, a broad scale. People go out knowing the information. They know how to use the crops. They know how to uh, produce uh, foods, various products that they can eat at home, whether it reaches a commercial scale or not. I think with the university growing also the, the commercialization, um, it can reach stages of patenting, producing products, and all of that, so that we can impact communities on a much larger scale. Colleagues, thank you. Um, do you want to have one or two last words? Our time is really short. To yes. and Leanne. Yes, I just want to say that in closing, uh, SDGs are, are not just a password. I think that is very important. We need to understand that. And to answer your question, I believe that SDGs should be in every module, every teacher that will stand in front of a class to teach their student, they, their students need to know about the sustainable development goals. I think that is very, very important. So imagine our students, the graduates that we'll be producing, if they are immersed yes. in the sustainable development goals. We are really going to be uh, addressing so many other issues that we may face in the future. Um, thank you so much. So just in closing, just to um, add on what you've said, I think knowledge dissemination is very important because I think we all know with, um, like for instance, Cape Town Day Zero, they asked where were the researchers? Why didn't they warn us about this? And with the, um, with the floods, recent floods in Durban, again, they asked where are the researchers? Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to um, take over the space and start really making an impact with our research, mm -hmm. start really getting it out there because we can influence policy if we just put our heads together. Thank you. Colleagues, thank you for those inspiring words. I think, um, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think universities are getting a new lease on life as experts. And we saw that in the COVID era, who was advising government? It has to be in this area as well. So thank you for that. You've been very inspiring and we're very proud to have you as part of UJ. With that, we're going to get to the main part of our program which is Dr. Karina van Royen, who's going to launch the SLP, an introduction to the Sustainable Development Goals. She's going to introduce you to the whole program and to one very picky professor within it. So over to you, Karina. Thanks, Denise. Let me just get the slides up. I think it's ready. Right. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. So I have the, the, the wonders to introduce you to what actually in the, is in this course. Um, Prof. Mpedi made talking about this slide totally unnecessary, how impressive UJ has been, already been acknowledged, but also how much more we can do. So let me talk, tell you a little bit about the purpose of, the, of this uh, short learning program on the SGDs. Um, it's really introductory. It's interdisciplinary. Um, and it introduces us to the United Nations 17 goals. Um, 
the reason why they came about um, and how they are a comprehensive framework with various synergies between them, but also with various trade-offs within and between some of these SGDs. Um, and then also we consider in the program some of the critiques, because the SGDs was, is not all wonderful, there's critiques against them, and we want to consider those. I think what's really important for us in our approach in this course is that we're contextualizing the SGDs for the African context and for South Africa. So one of the things we do in the course, we look at what is the alignment between the SGDs and the African Union's Agenda 2063 and also South Africa's National Development Plan, our NDP. Now, both of these goals precedes the SGDs. So in that regard, they're really important for our context. And in the course, we explore some of those alignments um, to make sure that the SDGs really speak to our context and to, to what we need. So the course is fully online. It's self-paced. Uh, it'll take you, um, um, you can start any time. It'll take you about 50 hours to complete the course. Um, and once you've successfully completed the course, there is assessments in the course. Once you've uh, uh, completed the course successfully, you will be um, awarded with a digital certificate um, that you can view and share with others, third parties. Um, and you can also, um, it'll, it's available on the UJ Digital Certificate platform. And for students who's currently registered at UJ, um, who's completing this course successfully, it also appears on the academic record. Um, now, the course is um, not a standalone course. It's part of a suite of courses developed by our division, Academic Development and Support. Um, and you might have heard of the others, too, that's already available. Really exciting courses that UJ offers for free for all UJ staff and students, but also to the public. Uh, part of our commitment um, to get the word out around sustainability. Now, the course is really delivered in five units um, um, with a little intro overview and a so what at the end. Um, and the five units really um, starts off with what's the origin of the SGD. So how did they come about? We contextualize it in the idea of development. Um, post 45, um, looking at uh, the idea of green development, sustainable development coming to the fore by the 1980s, um, moving on towards the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, and then the whole debate in 2012 at post Rio, um, Rio Plus 20 um, about what now that the MGDs are going to end in 2015, what next? Um, and important for us in that tracing that history is we also consider some of the African ideas, whether about Ubuntu and Ujamaa, that speak to ideas around sustainability and, and development. Um, the course itself um, is really structured around what is the so-called wedding cake, the SGD wedding cake. It really indicates the, the groupings of the SGDs really into four broad groupings. The biosphere, um, society and economy, and the one that appears right at the end is the kind of the middle core, governance, the implementation, and the peace and security context that we need um, to ensure um, the SGDs actually are implemented um, and can happen. Um, I will go a little bit faster. Well, I want to introduce you to this professor. Our, it's our UJ professor, Hoop Hoop, Adrian. <laughs> Do you want to stand, the creator of, of Prof. Hoop Hoop? Um, and you would have heard, um, she's not only our mascot in the course, we also have a course song that you heard a little bit when, when Boykanya's video was, was played. Um, a wonderful friend of mine, Nishlan Ramana, is a jazz composer, um, a pianist, and um, he, he graciously allowed us to use that um, kind of the chorus of, his, of one of his um, compositions as our course, course song. Um, now, um, Prof Hoop Hoop, um, as you can see on this slide, um, she loves to sit on books whenever she's reading, and so whenever you find her in the course, she really is inviting you to, to read um, with her. At other times, she also loves videos um, and loves listening two videos, um, then she has her earphones on, and the videos can be some of the framing videos we have. There's some UJ experts that um, is providing videos in the course. Sometimes we have course um, uh, videos embedded in the course. Um, and 
Uh, once she has done lots of reading and she's been li listening to videos, watching videos, she loves to engage and share with others um, how she is making meaning of sustainability and SGDs. Um, and in that way, these conversation forums that she's going into, uh, she has reflection spaces where she goes, there's some fun activities, um, there's even a, a, a jigsaw puzzle that she wants you to build with her. Um, and for those of you that have a keen eye, I hope you would have noted that, um, that um, this uh, Prof Hoop Hoop is very cool as well. She loves changing colours. If you look at her, her beads around her neck or, or, or the, the earphone she has on or the pencil she's holding, they change colours depending on what SGD she's, she's engaging, following kind of the UN branding of the SGD colours. Um, just to give you a quick sense of the kind of course activities um, and what happens, um, the kind of things that happens in the units um, in the course. There's some framing videos. The framing videos really um, kind of sets the scene, give a context of this is the SGD, these are the targets of the SGDs, um, this is how it's aligned with Agenda 2063, the NDP. Um, here is specifically the influence of COVID-19 pandemic has been massive on the SGD, so we really consider that as well. Um, and then we also look at, okay, but what's the issues and the problems that remain here, or what's the critiques? Um, and specifically important is to recognize there's lots of trade-offs and synergies in the SGDs. In some cases, within an SGD, there are targets that's in contradiction. And in other cases, um, there's between the different SGDs trade-off necessary, and so we want to consider that as well. And that's typically through the framing videos. Then there's readings. The readings tend to be short, light, two, three pages, sometimes 10 pages, it's out of a short article, or it's a blog piece, or conversation piece, Prof and Petty, I have there somewhere a video of you talking, I'm giving an interview, um, so um, there's, there's that kind of reading that's compulsory, but then there's also lots of additional optional reading, so if you want to dig in a little bit more deeper, want to become a little bit more academic, there's, there's links to, to lots further readings that you can also do. Um, there's lots of fun activities, I hope they're fun activities, um, really to get you engaged in the course, they go from, you know, little quizzes, did you know this, or can you respond to this, what for you are the most challenging, you know, the, the most important SGD that we, that we should do, um, there is kind of, did you know boxes, as I mentioned, there's here and there a puzzle, um, there's Mentimeter things, um, etc. Then we have really important, the UJ expert videos. And um, you would have seen in the booklet, we acknowledge, and I see a few of you here, thank you very much for your contributions. It's short little three to five minute little videos of UJ experts, UJ academics, talking about their research and how it relates to the SGDs. Um, and um, any of you here that have not yet contributed or would like to, we are really keen to keep on adding to our pool of videos from UJ experts talking about their research. So if you would like to contribute a three little, short three minute little video, please contact me. Or we have a course, email, I think it's not sure, it's not down there, I'll have a look now. It's sgds at uj.ac.za. Um, and you can contact us there, we would love to, to have some more videos. And a few of you, I have your names if you attended. So I do expect an email from you <laughs> asking a, a contribution. Um, and I mean, I think through these videos, we don't only want to showcase what UJ is already um, um, kind of doing um, and, and um, um, you know, that, that we're already kind of doing really amazing stuff. Um, but we also hope that, that course participants will be inspired, like we were inspired by the panel this morning or this afternoon. About, uh, about the amazing things people, people are already doing. Those conversation forums where we particularly ask questions and get one another to engage. Because it's self-based, there's, there's not a teacher or a meeting or anything. So our meeting is asynchronous in our conversation forums. And then there's also open conversation forums where you can start a conversation about something that you've read or a thing that has you, has you going. Um, and then we have also reflection spaces where we encourage course participants, not only to reflect on what they've learned in a particular unit, but also how they've learned that um, and what, what they're taking from it um, into their lives. And then, as I mentioned, of course, um, assessment. Um, assessment has, happens at the end of each unit. Um, it's a short little quiz, 10 questions. 
um, and you have to pass 50% um, to, to get to the next unit, and you have to pass all the units with 50%, all five, to be awarded the, the certificate. Um, and then, of course, you're all now keen to sign up and go start it. Um, so for UJ staff and students, you simply go to our U-Link, um, and you, by logging in with your UJ credentials, you go to the little block online courses, and you will find, under online courses, you will find um, the courses, um, three courses at the moment there. Um, from our online courses, you click on the, on the one on the SGDs, and you simply register at the bottom. And that will be live from next week um, for you to go sign up. Um, and then I think lastly, just an acknowledgement to the people who's worked um, on this. Um, um, Prof. Perry for being the inspiration um, and getting not just us, but the whole university with Denise thinking around sustainability. And, and what it means for us as UJ and our social impact and our contribution in our society. Um, for Prof Tia, um, the Senior Director at ADS, um, for, for, for leading this. Um, Shanae, um, you're somewhere here. Where's Shanae? Where, there's Shanae. Um, Shanae, you also have seen the pamphlet. Shanae has been wonderful. Um, in, she's been in contact with a number of UJ expert pe people for the videos. She's coordinated that. Um, she is basically doing everything that I'm not getting my hands on <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> um, wonderful. And then um, I think I've mentioned Adrian, who's been wonderful, not just in, in bringing Prof Hoopup to life, but also in a whole range of design elements for us um, around the course. And I think that is it. Welcome to Prof Hoopup's course. Thank you so much for that. I have to say I'm lost in admiration. I'm lost in admiration at the commitment and the creativity and the excitement and all of the energy that our colleagues have brought to this. I, what more can I say? I am lost in admiration. Thank you, everybody, for this. We are a little over time. But I wondered if there were any pressing questions that we it would be impossible to leave the room without having answered from anybody. Yes, we have one over there. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Lebo Ayobiojo from the Community Engagement Unit. Um, first of all, I, I also want to thank Prof Mbedi and the people that are behind this great initiative. And um, I was really touched by your last question to the panelists in terms of what can be an intervention to have a great impact within the university community. And then I was thinking the third core pillar of the university is community engagement. Correct. How do we, so we have existing student volunteer programs and even during COVID, our students had showed great interest in terms of giving back. And Dr. Karina mentioned again, um, you know, that there are open forums where obviously students can exchange knowledge and information about the SDGs. And fortunately at UJCE, we are using the SDG as a framework for students to register their project, whether it's, it's, it's community-based research, whether it's service learning and organized outreach. How do we involve the community engagement student volunteer champions from across the campuses to be involved in this great initiative? And then again, I love the fact that the program says SDG 4.0. So the great news is the students of UJ have been going to different schools, you know, CBOs, and we are so focused on digital literacy. And some of the children before COVID, we were giving them opportunities to come to, you know, like the IT labs at APB to learn basic computer skills. So my question is, how can we make sure that the university at large, even our academics, are registering their community engagement 
projects because this is another way of us sustaining not only the global rankings but really showing the university what is embedded in the mission. And the mission of UJ is talking about humanity and community and that also translates to the UJ values, the fourth one which is ethical foundation. Ubuntu is another one that is highly highlighted and we always tell the student volunteer champions if you can go with an approach of mutual beneficial, uh, 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 you know, a value of the university conversation and so forth, this is how our university will grow. And that's how we have sustainable leaders for the unborn generation. Thank you. Lebo, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to ask Professor Mpedi to respond to that shortly. But I, I just want to say I'm so glad to hear that we're making connections across the various aspects that we do at the university. So we, we do think about SDGs and research, simple things like the keywords that we use in the research that we produce. But community engagement, and we've heard about that from our panel, is absolutely integral to making, an Im to making that research that we do have an impact. And it is also absolutely integral to our teaching, as we heard um, earlier. And it's also integral to the way the university conducts itself within the communities and the environments that it finds, us, finds itself. So I'm very glad that you have raised that as a question. And I'm going to hand over to Professor Mpedi to say, how can we as a university take that particular question forward? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an important question, but I'm not sure if I have all the answers uh, right away. What I would suggest is that, um, how about you linking up uh, um, with uh, the colleagues, you know, at, at least those in my domain, and to, to share the ideas that you have? I'm sure you didn't just ask a question, but you may have suggestions. I think what we need is to create an environment where anyone and everyone can come forward and say, I've got this bright idea. And us as leaders have a duty to listen and see how best we can run with it. And for, from my side, if it's something that I can take forward with, uh, my MEC counterpart who's responsible for that, then we'll do that because we work as a team. And I know many students have uh, uh, all sorts of initiatives. It's how we share this and publicize this. Many of our community engagement initiatives are not known and shared. I know, for example, when I was dean at the Faculty of Law, many, uh, actually at every year level, there were community initiatives that students were really proud of and they impacted on communities. It's also about how we bring everything together. So I would suggest that engage with, with um, my, my colleagues and through that then we'll see how best we can take this forward. Um, another important thing uh, uh, to mention now is we, we really want to get students uh, involved in this, you know. And I'm not blaming our students, but if you look at students overseas in terms of their level of engagement, it's much higher than what we have, and I don't think our students don't want to. It's about how we rally all of our students in, you know, to contribute and, 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 and help us take our societies forward in various ways. So I'm excited about that. And to encourage student participation next year, uh, Prof. Divet will be running a nice competition. Um, will you talk about it, Karina, and give more details about that? but really student involvement and stuff. And not separately, another thing is you have staff doing their thing, students doing their thing. It would be nice if we do more of things that we do together and, and, and towards um, a particular goal. The last thing that I wanna say, which was also mentioned here, we do great research, but if research does not impact the, com the communities that we, we serve, then it doesn't, it doesn't help. And with SDGs, I have no doubt you can see that, look, uh, um, if, if we do this well, and we're doing great work, but we need to make sure that it translates also into impact and, and, and things that we can see. It's always nice to look back and say we were here, and now look at now we are here, and this is where we are going. I know I didn't answer you precisely, but what I just said is an invitation to sit down and see how best we can work. If you don't come, okay, come straight to me, and we'll coordinate and make this not just a program. It's something that we wanted to to, to, to yield more activities, whether you work on SDG one alone or three or, you know, as long as we all put our efforts, when it combines, will make a huge difference. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank Let you me hand over to Karina to talk about the competition. Karina, you wanted to say something? Probably just very quickly. So um, we, we're hoping, and we, I'm going to invite you come, to come chat with us about that. We, we're hoping, linked to the course, to start running an annual competition 
for specifically the students that's enrolled in the course, where we want to have teams submitting ideas of how they are contributing to, you know, with projects and whatever nature, whether it's an innovation, whether it's intervention, whether it's working with whoever across faculties, um, teams submitting proposals um, of how we can address sustainability and sustainability issues. Um, and then lots of talks still necessary, but ideally a competition where you actually, if you're the winner, we actually have UJ behind you to actually pilot, if you want, the idea that you have, that we start to make real the ideas that, that's also with our students. So okay. we'll definitely chat with you. Thank okay, you. I think we have time for just one or two more. Rudy? Right. Uh, thank you, Program Director. Uh, uh, just a quick uh, comment. I, I sat here and uh, I am so excited about the whole in initiative. I'm actually late for the council chair's book reading. And we brought a book club especially there, but it's worth, it's worth it to spend the time. So the needs I wanted to just make the comment, uh, what the two points that's been raised and what uh, Prof. Perry has said. The big thing for me is, and I know that we, with Dr. Van Ruen, we worked together from the time that BQ, that is now Evidence Network, was formed. And I'm just thinking about the excitement of the initiative. Uh, and maybe I'm making this comment because I work directly with government and I interact with them every day. And it's a big loophole. So I can see a very bold initiative, Prof. Mpedi, especially with the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation. So sometimes I get in trouble with government because I said, hey, government, when you implement and you do things, you suck. <laughs> and then they say, hey, careful. But the point I'm really making is that there's a big problem in government, good at planning policy development, bad at implementation. So UJ stands at the epitome of being a yardstick for government to be able to monitor and evaluate impact in terms of the sustainable development goals. Dr. Van Ruen, I've got another question on the NDPs. I'm gonna withdraw that one for now. I'll come and have a word with you, just the link. But I'm just, it's just a comment, Denise, just to say it will be a yardstick for monitoring and evaluation because we will be able to have a dashboard to say this is the impact that you just made. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rudy. I think I'm going to call this to a close now. I'm very pleased that you ended with some excitement and ended with acknowledging UJ for what it is doing in this area. Again, I want to thank all of the colleagues and all of our wise people who are really passionate about these issues and are actually going the extra mile to do something about it in a way that will inevitably make an impact. So colleagues, thank you very much for attending today. Um, on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to um, invite you to a few refreshments. Um, and I'm sorry that we are a little over time. However, I think it was worth it. So thank you all. <laughs>